Hi, Tob hi, Tobias. Hello, Dennis. Thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. Um, you're both running for Secretary of State, and I'm hoping that you can start off by telling us a little bit about um, who you are and why you think you are voters' best choice. And um, Tobias, if you wouldn't mind going first, that'd be great. Sure. Well, I'm Tobias Reed. I've had the honor of serving as state treasurer for the last uh, seven, uh, seven and a half years. And I'm running for Secretary of State because this office plays such a central role in so much that we care about when it comes to our government. Um, my, I have the fundamental belief that we are better off as a state, stronger and more resilient when more people are participating in our processes. And we have lots to be proud of in Oregon um, that lead us to be among the the highest in terms of voter turnout. I think we need to defend that to make it um, more convenient for people to vote. And simultaneously, of course, the Secretary of State has an important role to try to match the good intentions we have in Oregon with execution that should follow. Uh, the state auditory function uh, really needs to be driven not by a political agenda or, or weaponization of the, the powers of the office, but by realistic assessments of risk uh, and making sure um, that those outcomes, those results are being delivered for Oregon. So we've seen the Secretary of State's office over the last uh, years deal with a lot of instability and, and turnover. Uh, and I want to bring the, the stability and professionalism that I've built uh, as state treasurer to an office that I think really needs it. So I'm excited about the conversation today and I appreciate you uh, making time for us. Great, thank you very much. Um, Dennis, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you think your voters best choice? You, you bet. Um, the state of Oregon faces enormous challenges. We have a laundry list of social ills that are tearing at the fabric of our lives and people are finally standing up and saying they want change. Uh, part of this uh, stems from weakness that we've seen in the Secretary of State's office um, and accountability, transparency, and ethic are all issues that are on the Secretary of State's website, but they aren't being followed through. As Tobias mentioned, we ought to be following through with these issues and um, striking them home. Uh, I have been a state senator. My name is Dennis Linthicum. Uh, obviously, I've been a state senator in District 28, which is part of Jackson County, Southern Deschutes, and all of Klamath County. Prior to the last redistricting, it also included Crook County and Lake County. And I served as a Klamath County commissioner before being uh, elected to the state Senate. So I have a master's degree uh, from Biola University and I earned a BA in economics from UCLA. These are both uh, relevant degrees with regard to the Secretary of State because I've got a background that has been on the cutting edge of software and technology develop, microelectronics, semiconductors, uh, database management, and um, these are all skill sets that the Secretary of State needs to effectively organize elections and bring uh, elections to fruition. So thanks for this conversation this afternoon. I think um, facts matter, precision matters, accountability matters. These are all important issues for Oregonians. Great, thank you very much. Um, Dennis, let's start with you on this question. What do you think is the biggest need at the Secretary of State's office and how would you address it? And if you can be as specific as possible, that'd be great. You you bet. The Secretary of State's office plays um, you know, four essential roles. One is election integrity. And I think that's a, where the largest need is. But the other is state audits and um, the Secretary of State is the chief auditor. And the Secretary of State also sits on two important boards, the Oregon Sustainability Board and um, the uh, Land Use uh, Board. And so both of those positions are relevant. But I think election integrity is the issue and transparency is more of a problem than integrity. We could, we could, for example, argue there's no widespread evidence of voter fraud, but at the same time, nobody really knows the details because the public is not allowed access to some of the raw data. 
Um, I was part of a freedom of information request in Jackson County, and the county clerk told us we could have the data we were requesting if we would deposit with them a check for the amount of $987,000. Dollars. That's as close to a million as you can get. And, um, and so nobody really ever saw the details of that uh, request because we were trying to do a forensic audit, looking at data, looking at how to interpret the data, looking at how to understand the data and the election results that happened in 2020. The um, Oregon revised statutes require that information be kept for two years so that people can peruse the data, but you can't peruse the data if you don't have a million dollars in your bank account and are willing to surrender it to the county clerk. So this system is fraught with transparency issues, which I can easily solve by um, bringing uh, openness to the Office of Secretary of State where it doesn't currently exist. I would like to dive into that a little bit more, but Tobias, if you can go first and, and talk about what you think are the, the, what's the biggest need for the Secretary of State's office and how you'd address it. Yeah, I think the biggest needs uh, center around uh, restoring trust and accountability to the office and being a, a defender of democracy. Um, we can see all over uh, the country, frankly, the, the ways that our, our democracy is really at risk. And I think that is uh, a cause for, for great concern. We've got a lot of things to be proud of in Oregon that put us in a better position, but we shouldn't take those things for granted. And so the Secretary of State's office, I think, and the Secretary of State in particular, has a great responsibility uh, to make clear the advantages of the system that we have and make sure that we are continuing to, to innovate and make it as convenient and secure and inclusive as possible. Uh, that same kind of um, stability and professionalism uh, that we built at, at Treasury, I think, is also in need uh, at the Secretary of State's office. While I've been Treasury, you, you know this, we've had, we've had four Secretaries of State. So stability and, and clarity in terms of uh, priorities within, within the office, a, an audit system that is built not on, uh, on anecdotes or agendas, but on realistic assessments of risk, all of these things, I think, uh, have the potential to contribute to a restored sense of, of trust and confidence and uh, accountability in an office that, that Oregonians depend on. Great, thank you. Um, Dennis, I'd like to, to go back to, to what you're saying. And I, I guess my question is, if you're elected Secretary of State, how would you provide that transparency and those assurances into, uh, into um, the, the integrity of the vote? Like I mean, is the idea that you would you would want all those all of those ballot images available for the public to see in every county, or or how would you accomplish that? Yeah, it, beautiful question. Um, and the the it, it does require precision with regard to how would you accomplish this because the how would you is at the county level. Our elections are run at the county level. The Secretary of State is the chief uh, election officer, but that doesn't mean they run the county offices. Uh, we are very familiar with voting for your county clerk. The county clerk within your local area is the uh, elections officer for that county. And we have disparate populations. We The smaller counties, Sherman County, Lake County, Gilliam, these counties have much lower populations than Multnomah, Clackamas, Washington. And so there are different avenues for how do you pursue that. But for, for each of those counties, the ballot images, which cannot be tied to an individual, don't have what is known as private information buried on them. The information that would be buried on them is um it is purely part of the processing in fact if you think about what the um current secretary of state demanded the secretary of state demanded that human eye review every ballot front and back perusing those images for personal data now first of all there is no personal data on it but if you did write your uh, dog's name Fifi and somebody could determine that's how you voted 
that's uh, that's supposedly what we're trying to stop. However, notice that an automated system, an imaging system, an analytical, statistical, stoical um, analysis can't come across that data and understand it. They have no idea what that is or how it works. And so to imagine that somebody in Jackson County wanted this information and they were going to sift through it looking for your private data is quite frankly just absurd. The other thing that each county could do is they could have non-disclosure agreements with people who got this private data. For example, every human eye, which would belong to potentially uh, 20 or 30 individuals as they're perusing this, every one of those individuals, somehow the, the clerk's office or the secretary of state isn't afraid of them knowing this private information. So then why would they be afraid if somebody went rummaging through that with a high speed computer that was analyzing the data, counting up the number of votes for person A versus person B? So I think the argument about privacy is a, a loose-knit argument, and it doesn't hold water. And that's the real problem with transparency means transparency. Yes, those images should be available to everybody in the county. If you're a county resident, you ought to be able to see that data. I would suggest most people wouldn't bother they would, um, uh, but individuals per se might investigate um, discrepancies. So it's perfectly legitimate. And so you don't. Alan, you, I, go ahead. Well, let me just. I, I guess I'm wondering. I mean, it, it seems like a, a hugely um, uh, expensive way to go about showing uh, or providing an, uh, information. Aside from the the privacy issue, it's just sort of like the the cost associated with something like that across the county, making it available to whoever wants to. Do you not have any other thoughts in terms of how you can possibly in assure people of the security of their elections that are run by their elected clerk, um, other than providing, you know, having widespread access to ballot images? Well, the, the the ballot images isn't really a problem. That it's it's just data. We have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, and to allow web access to that data, to know who has uh, reached out to assess that data, is perfectly uh, legitimate. It happens all the time. People are always selling data, navigating through large data sets. Um, you can get large data sets that I I could see each of us who are on this call, what magazines you might subscribe to, um, what uh, websites you visited today. All of that kind of traffic information is collected today. Now, I'm not sure that we should be collecting all of that traffic information, but it is available and you can purchase it. And um, and that's actually, people have used that data, for example, tracking cell phones and how close cell phones are to ballot boxes and how many times that cell phone went to that ballot box and trying to determine if there's any um, dark of night things happening with an election. I don't think it's expensive. It may unearth some things that we're not really ready to um, unearth, but nevertheless, it's what transparency is all about. And Tobias, I'm wondering if you uh, want to respond to any aspects of that, specifically if you have any thoughts about um, just how to assure people of, of election um, uh, yeah. the security. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think this is just a, a clear contrast in terms of, of values. I want to be about restoring trust and accountability. Um, I'm not about trying to, to, to weaponize the powers of the, of the Secretary of State's office. And frankly, I think this is exactly the kind of thing that we have seen in, in Georgia and in Arizona and Michigan. And it's not what we what we need in Oregon. What I'm excited about is ways that we can build confidence that, that voters have in our system there are a few counties in Oregon, as, as you know, Multnomah and Washington and Clackamas among them, and a couple others as well, who use something called ballot tracks. That's a brand name, and there are other ways to provide that service. But as, as all of you probably know, it's the system that allows voters to opt in and get a series of messages 
one when a, a ballot is sent so that uh, voters know to be on the lookout for it, another when the ballot is received uh, either by mail or in a drop box, and a third when uh, the, the, it says essentially your ballot has been accepted and will be counted. Each of these giving voters a chance to, to understand where their ballot is in the process and building that kind of confidence. I mentioned before, I think, um, the other thing that, that is exciting that, that happens in, in California, some counties doing ride-alongs uh, with ballots and letting people um, go through the, the process that the, the ballot uh, follows the the path um, and allowing how to um, allowing them to, to have a better understanding of that. Um, the clerk in, in Maricopa County um, is allowing uh, more journalists uh, to be part of, of that process and have a better understanding of how uh, ballots work as well. And I think that that is another uh, another method that, that could contribute to greater uh, confidence and, and transparency. But um, this is for me about how to how to build up uh, people's confidence and enthusiasm and making it convenient uh, and, and building that confidence. Great. Thank you. Um, I do want to stay on uh, some elections related questions. And, um, you know, one of the a big part of the secretary of state's office is is also handling um, elections complaints, um, campaign contribution complaints, et cetera. This will arguably get even more complicated once the new uh, campaign contribution limits go into effect. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the $500,000 donation that um, the Democratic Party of Oregon re reported um, and reported under the name of uh, Prime Trust as opposed to the true donor, Nishad Singh. And Tobias, if you wouldn't mind going first on this, are you, do you think the misreporting of this donation was adequately investigated by the Secretary of State's office? And are you happy with the, with the outcome of it? Well, I'm not happy that people don't feel confident about it. I, of course, don't have all of the details about the investigation or the process that uh, has occurred, but I can be really clear about the responsibility that the Secretary of State has. That is to enforce the law and apply standards consistently. And I won't ever lose sight of the fact that that's my responsibility. If I'm lucky enough to be Secretary of State, I won't hesitate to do that. I have never been afraid of doing things that are right, even when they're inconvenient, and I won't be a Secretary of State. So one of the things that um, then Secretary of State Fagan did not do was require the elections um, director to recuse herself. The elections director, as you know, used to be deputy director of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Is that something that you would have done? And Tobias, well, if you can... Sure. I, I will be really clear on this. If I'm lucky enough to be Secretary of State, uh, I think you will note that, that my decisions uh, around hiring in the elections division will be about hiring elections professionals. Uh, that's a really important thing uh, to give people confidence and to make sure that those those standards are upheld uh, consistently, not partisans. And so I guess, would is that something that you would have been that you would have said your past association uh, is uh, something that gives me concern as secretary of state? So I, I would like you to recuse yourself. Uh, the answer to that is yes. But I think in, in my situation, uh, if I'm if I'm lucky enough to be there, uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to be looking for someone who is who is an election professional, uh, not okay. someone who has a has a partisan background. OK, great. Um, and um, in terms of the decision to reduce the fine, I mean, there's been recent So Carlos just recently wrote about this, um, that it's very clear that there were members of the staffers of the Democratic Party of Oregon who were who were familiar with the fact that um, the FTX cryptocurrency executives had used, had made previous donations under the name of Prime Trust. And um, that information was shared among a, a small group of people, at least at the, the Democratic Party of Oregon. Um, do you think that reducing the fine um, is was the right call? Do you think that the the lack of um, a, a uh, the original fine that was called for was the, the right decision? I don't know why they decided to to reduce the the fine, but I think that certainly sends a, a bad signal. Thank you. Um, Dennis, I'm wondering if you can respond to to kind of the same case, the same issue. Um, how would you have handled that situation if you were Secretary of State and um, you know, uh, either the Democratic Party of Oregon or the Republican Party of Oregon were uh, implicated in a potential false reporting of a donor case? 
Right. The uh, this issue is extremely relevant because we're talking about a half a million dollars that actually got funneled back through Oregon, you know, coming along Democrat only party lines. So Wyden got some money, Merkley got some money, Wagner got some money, you know, the governor got some money, et cetera. And we see all of these players, and I'm sorry to refer to these people by their last names, but I don't want to take all day to name them all. Um, and these players are all Democrat Party loyalists. And the the DNC reference that you point out shows what happens when there is one party control. The best way to restore accountability, for example, would be to have a secretary of state who was from the opposite party, much like myself. I'm the Republican. The current party uh, makeup is governor, house, Senate, all Democrat majorities and maybe super majorities. And this is the time where we sprinkle a little bit of salt into the mixture and say, we need somebody who's a professional skeptic, somebody who will take a hard look at these facts and um, restore some light to this um, process, which has been masked behind he said, she said, she knew, he didn't know, et cetera. And so I think um, it's perfectly appropriate to have an individual like myself come into the mix, be able to shine light in the dark corners, identify the players, and know I would not reduce fines on an issue like this. This is too important and it's too relevant to our current um, su supposedly protecting democracy. This isn't how you protect democracy. You don't protect democracy by creating a standard where the uniparty, the one party that's in rule, maintains power and maintains control over all facets of state government. This is a perfect opportunity to elect a Republican to this office. It's an important day for Oregonians to recognize how valuable this will be to bring somebody who can make change, real change, into the conversation. Okay, so, um, Dennis, if you can go first on, on this question. There's been a push nationally to um, undermine the integrity of, of vote by mail. Is that something that you would seek to roll back or change at all in, in Oregon? The um, vote by mail is problematic when it comes to chain of command. Um, earlier, my opponent was suggesting that track your vote would be a solution to this. But what, what that doesn't tell you is it doesn't tell you that your vote got counted correctly. It just says your ballot was received. You could call your county clerk's office, for example, and they would say, yep, your ballot was received. It was counted on Wednesday of election week and it's valid and it counted and whatever. And then you could ask a follow up question. Do you know who I voted for? And they're sorry, we can't tell you that. Why not? Because the two, the security envelope and the ballot have been separated and never the two shall mix. And so you'll never ever be able to ascertain that how you voted counted because nobody can tell you how you voted. Therefore, you don't know that your vote shows up in the grand total. You talk about um, hurting democracy, but the best thing we could do to support one person, one vote would be to clean our voter rolls and then restore valid ID with a valid vote. That's how you buy real estate. That's what title companies exist for. That's what um, escrow officers do. And in the old days, when I was younger, we would walk down with our children in tow and we would vote at a polling place. You would sign in, you would get your ballot, you'd fill out the ballot, turn it in, and that bit of chain of command was complete. Now, you still didn't know, I'll admit, at the end of the day that they counted your ballot correctly, but it got counted at the polling place. It did not get counted at the central location. And it gets worse because here in Klamath County, 
Our mail, my baby post office, sends my mail to Medford. Medford sends my mail to Portland, and Portland puts the postmark on it. So my mail is a long ways from where I live when it's finally getting postage stamped um, or postmarked, excuse me, uh, because all the ballots are stamped by the taxpayer. And that ballot goes hand in hand all the way down the chain and nobody can tell me what happened to that ballot on its merry way down the road. So I think in-person balloting is the way to secure one person, one vote, one citizen, one vote would be appropriate because you. this is federal law. You've got to be a United States citizen to vote in our electoral system. And so that's something that you would want, you would support as Secretary of State um, going going back to in-person voting and, and, and canceling the, or doing away with vote by mail. The Secretary of State has no power to impact this. I can talk about it. I can be on the bully pulpit. I can argue the case for it. And somebody else maybe can argue a better case against it. And will let bygones be bygones. I cannot affect that. I cannot change that. That's a legislated mandate. So the Secretary of State is bound to be obedient to that mandate. But it doesn't mean I left my brain outside the office. I still know how to think. I still have logic. I still understand reasoning. And I can see the problem with vote by mail and the loss of a chain of custody with regard to it correctly accounting for your personal contribution to our democratic republic. Um, Tobias, do you have any concerns about the um, uh, security of the vote by mail system? Would you seek to make any changes on that front? There is a reason we have audits uh, and audit requirements. And I think I can answer your question really directly because there, there is a really clear difference here. I think we are better when we have more people voting, when we make it more convenient, when we build people's confidence in this in this process. But this is a, a clear difference. I have not sued to overturn mail-in voting, and I'll protect our vote-by-mail system if I'm Secretary of State. I'll protect it against efforts to roll it back, and I'll protect it against people who are seeking to undermine confidence uh, in, in the way we do things in Oregon. Great. Um, I'd like to move on to um, ballot initiatives. And, you know, uh, Tobias, if you can go first on this question, do you um, think that there's any, is it too easy to get an initiative on the ballot or too difficult? Or do you see anything in the process that you think needs to be adjusted or changed? I think the the history of how ballot measures came to be in Oregon is is useful to consider here as a uh, a, a mechanism for people to have uh, voice against powerful and organized interests. And it's worth thinking about whether that is still the case and, and whether or not ballot measures have become their own interests and their own industry uh, in Oregon. Uh, we've always got room, I think, to, to continue to, uh, to refine and improve the systems, particularly as it relates to, um, to the administration, uh, to, to people's uh, tracking uh, of signatures, the way that those, uh, those people are, are paid and compensated. But ultimately, um, that's a really, I think, central thing to, to the way our system works and to the way we feel um, the, the supremacy of, of individual people. Um, and we have to make sure that, that that's maintained in a way that's, that's reflective of its, of its original intent. Do you think that there are um, ways that it is um, subject to, to uh, I guess, bias isn't quite the right word, but where you have people putting their thumb on the scale, either the attorney general's office in, in, um, in writing a ballot title or anything along those lines. Are there things along in, in that aspect that you think need to be revised? Well, I think there's certainly danger. Um, one one specific example that I think might be responsive to your to your question is is the notion of ballot title shopping. Um, if people uh, submit many different versions that are they're slightly tweaked um, in order to get a, a title that they perceive to be advantageous, um, that that doesn't strike me as as consistent with the intent of of putting forth a, a concept for for the consideration of voters. Um, so that that might be one good example. 
Great, thank you. Um, Dennis, do you have any thoughts in terms of like whether you think that the initiative process is too difficult, too easy, or if there are aspects of it that you need to be changed? I think there are aspects that need to be changed. And um, I think it's too easy. Uh, the validation, the number of uh, signatures required should probably be higher. Uh, and and the, the ballot title is often misleading. Um, my opponent did a good job of just referencing ballot title shopping, but it, it's actually much more uh, nefarious than that because um, you can uh, pay people to collect ballot signatures. IP 13 from uh, several years ago was the bill that would stop uh, the the killing of any mammal or fish or fowl actually. Um, so you you couldn't uh, harvest cattle. You couldn't harvest hogs. You couldn't you couldn't even kill a rat in your basement without being uh, in criminal violation of this um, measure to stop the killing of animals. IP 13 proponents were paying $30 an hour. Now, the number of people that you could pull out of the population who would be willing to work for $30 an hour is enormous. Our minimum wage is less than 20. So all of a sudden, now you've got private money competing with um, you know, people who are looking for work uh, and standing on a street corner and collecting things and saying, do you think, and the question would be something about, do you think we should be harvesting cattle um, in, you know, in, in large quantities? And people say, well, no, I'm not in, in favor of CAFO operations or whatever. The point is, it would put the cattle industry out of business in Oregon. Oh, actually, you could raise cattle, but you would have to send them uh, to a feedlot in Nebraska to get them slaughtered. And so th there are so many hidden details that to make it easy for ballot measure um, uh, IP13 that never went anywhere, um, to get on the ballot is problematic. And then the people who actually draft the language of the ballot is configured again by the single party majority. So there will be five people uh, who are on the committee to write the information for it. Those five people, three of them will be Democrats. Two of them today in Oregon will be Republicans typically and the ballot title will come out skewed. It will come out skewed because of how it's drafted. Now, I'm not saying that Republicans wouldn't use that same concept, that same rule, that same uh, logic when they create a, a committee to write the ballot title, but to pretend that that somehow offers people an insight into withholding or supporting or, you know, um, complaining about our democracy um, doesn't really hold water again, because these are all facets of self-government that we've got to learn to deal with. And as we learn to deal with these facets of self-governance, um, we will get better and better, but we've got to be willing to uh, tackle these problems straight on. Great, thank you. I just have two more quick questions related to elections and I do wanna move on to audits, but, um, and these are, are fairly quick. Um, Dennis, if you can go first on this. First of all, do you support the measure to establish ranked choice voting in Oregon? And second, um, would you support a primary, an open primary that allows all registered voters to to help choose the, uh, even weigh in on, on uh, uh, major party nominees? Uh, right. Both of those, I think, are uh, disagreeable um, options. Ranked rank choice voting is basically just too confusing. There's a Supreme Court case going uh, against ranked choice voting right now. They've agreed to accept the case. It won't get decided for a year or so. 
um, and people will feel disenfranchised and people won't really know how to fill out their ballot correctly or appropriately. So I think that's really problematic when it comes to ranked choice voting. You ought to just make a choice and live with it. And if you can't make that choice, then to choose the next guy or whatever seems a little problematic. With regard specifically to the um, the the question, the second part of your question was about an open uh, an open primary where yeah the open primary we we wondered about that in the Republican Party uh, two years ago. And I think the problem with that is, first of all, in the dual party system with just two parties uh, contending for, you know, uh, majorities, with that system, what you're looking for is the best Democrat or the best Republican but you're not looking for all the Democrats to put in their voice on who the worst Republican might be, or all the Republicans to put in their choice on who the weakest Democrat might be. If you're going to adhere to parties, then the party system ought to be available right now. Oregon legislation has a two-party system we could allow for Greenpeace to become a majority party and constitutional party to become a majority party. And we all of those individual parties could compete in their own election process. And that would really fill out a ballot. But right now, because we're in this two party tribal mode, I do not think opening primaries to all comers is good for either um, concept. Uh, we ought to make uh, creating new laws and new regulations and new um, issues less um, uh, 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 less attainable because our government is about protecting the individual. And whenever a group becomes in charge, then the group has the power and the individual loses his power. So individual liberty depends on an open field, not everybody getting coalesced into a single um, ballot cast here or ballot cast there. Okay, thank you. Um, Tobias, same questions for you. Do you support ranked yep. choice voting? And I think I can answer the question pretty pretty directly and succinctly. I do support the ranked choice voting concept because I think it gives the chance for people uh, to more accurately reflect the nuances of their preferences. And and as I said before, my my view is we're better off when we have more people voting. I have some concerns about it, um, having talked to a, a good number of the county clerks who who are anxious about how ranked choice voting uh, will be implemented and if whether there are adequate time, there's adequate time and there are adequate resources to do a good job of that. Uh, so be really focused on, on that as well. And that leads to, I think, the answer to your second question, which is that I think it is really in the long run unsustainable for um, a large portion, the largest portion of voters who have chosen not to affiliate with a party to not have uh, a voice in, in that first step of our process. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that we've got a lot of things going on. So if ranked choice voting is to pass, I think we have uh, an obligation to, to see a good implementation of that as we have the conversation about what are the appropriate methods um, to make sure that, that people have, have a, a real way to participate at, at every stage. In the meantime, um, there have been some interesting conversations I've had with county clerks who, who have pointed out the, the uh, one effect of automatic voter registration when people are, of course, uh, registered without uh, a party affiliation, uh, a clerk, I may have told you the story before, uh, people come in and say, there's been a mistake, I needed the Republican ballot, or I needed the Democratic ballot, the clerk then has to explain that the deadline for that process has passed. Um, this clerk and, and confirmed by several others pointed out that they don't believe there would be any workload um, burden to allow, if the if the statute allowed for that, a later deadline, and, and the clerk could then print out the ballot uh, of that voter's preference and change the the affiliation right there. That's a, a shorter term solution, as I hope we have the the longer term conversation about how we make sure that people uh, of every political persuasion have a voice uh, at the earliest stages and throughout our process. Great, thank you. 
Um, moving on to audits, um, Tobias, if you can go first on this question. Um, it seems that audits have increasingly become the way that we look for accountability of our uh, governmental agencies and programs, um, where they identify after the fact, some of the some of the ways that the processes weren't weren't well structured, or just the lack of attention paid to detail. How would you um, decide what to? Um, well, would you increase your account your auditing division at all? Um, and how would you seek to either um, to both choose audits as well as um, perhaps make them more more current as opposed to um, you know coming out perhaps a year or two after the fact? I, I like the way you asked that question. I think proactivity when it comes to audits um, is, a, is a really important concept and something I would, I would embrace. Um, what I've, I've joked about before is that um, as, as treasurer, uh, everybody has a, has a stock tip uh, for me. But when I'm running for Secretary of State, it feels like everyone has something they think should be audited. And they might all be right. But there's likely a, a gap between the capacity we have and, and the needs. So I want to be really clear that, that my ideas for, for how the audit division ought to be run and how an audit plan ought to be constructed center around realistic assessments of risk. And I could be more specific here, too. Um, this is financial risk. Where are we spending a lot of money? This is everyday real life risk. Where, where is the, uh, the well-being of Oregonians at stake? Where is our resilience at stake? Looking at those opportunities, those themes uh, to get uh, to get to a place and in, in, an inventory of, of things where we can get the best audit um, audit return. And as we improve the credibility of those uh, of those findings and, and connect them better with decision makers, I think we'll have the chance to, to increase capacity uh, in in the in the audit division. Um, performance audits can help us get get out in front and avoid those kinds of mistakes. And and you've obviously shown that really well in, in your own uh, in reporting in the Oregonian. Great, thank you. And and are there any areas that um, I, I know we asked you this during the primary, but are there any specific yeah. areas you have in mind for for audits at this point? I think it would be um, irresponsible to point to specific programs um, at this stage, but I think it again is is about um, real risks to lives. It, I think we can look at the at the fact that you know ninety percent plus of the budget is spent in education and human services and public safety. So it's reasonable to expect that that an audit plan would would have uh, a representation of each of those. Um, and and I want to be driven by data, uh, not by anecdotes, not by by weaponization of of audits. Great, thank you. Um, Dennis, same question for you on the audits division. Is there, can you talk about how you would decide what to, to audit and, and whether that's uh, an increase in the, the division is something you would seek? I think the um, appropriate response is based on the number of Oregonians that get impacted and specifically, um, uh, Tobias mentioned education. Obviously, that comes to the top of the heap, and it's also the most money, but it's going to affect the next generation. So education, environmental quality, water resources, transportation, justice department, all of these agencies um, would get a, a thorough, effective governance and accountability audit Sometimes what we see in these executive office uh, agencies is they're actually operating outside the bounds of their legislative requirements. And when they're operating outside the boundaries of their legislative requirements, they're, they're kind of on thin ice and it produces a risk assessment that's different than the risk assessment that um, Tobias was referring to. The risk assessment he was referring to is in this benevolence of the state concept. The risk assessment that I'm referring to is in actually damaging the uh, future of the state by damaging the future population, the next generation, damaging the um, monetary liability that the state carries when dealing, it, when misdealing with individuals um, and um, trying to negotiate a regimentation of their private and individual lives. Um, with Oregon Water Resources Department, a couple of years ago, we saw a case where they said, 
uh, any well within one lineal distance of the Sprague River is violating the water quality and um, flow for in-stream water, and they shut those wells down, and they demanded those individuals turn off their well pumps. There was no science for this. There was no data for this. They were clearly outside, out, operating outside their boundary, but they effectively put that in until lawsuits were brought forward. Once the lawsuits were brought forward, they changed it from 5,280 feet, i.e. one mile, down to 100 feet. And then the judge said, well, this is moot case. We don't, we'll just throw it out now. And the potential, if that had not have happened at the court level, the potential liability for damaging those nearly 150 farms and ranches by a policy that was clearly outside of Oregon Water Resource Department boundaries is enormous. And so these are things that um, are essential for an adopting an audit strategy that resolves the problems before they occur. Because if you wait until afterwards or once you see the headlines and you see the lawsuits, you're already behind the curve. So maintaining public visibility and transparency throughout the auditing process fosters this confidence in government operations and lets people know that we are watching, we're paying attention, and we're holding these agencies accountable. Great, thank you. Um, we've spent a lot of time on elections and, and a little bit on audits, but there's many more uh, divisions within the Secretary of State's office. There's the, their position on the state lands board. Um, uh, Dennis, if you could go first on this question, you know, looking at that or the corporations division or, or archives or anything, are there any other um, priorities or uh, programs that you would look to to change or in any way if, if elected Secretary of State? I think that the the corporations we we probably charge too much for people to get incorporated here in Oregon. What we really want, and it's it's not a lot, but we should make it less. We should um, allow people to incorporate and start businesses at the drop of a hat. We should just be willing to let people go into business here in Oregon and get those kinds of things rolling, let them take the initiative, let them take the risk and let them simply get along with their um, with licensing and those kinds of things. I think where I can play a really important part is in the um, sustainability board. Um, your listeners may be interested to know that my wife and I and our kids were raised here live off the grid. There's no electric utility cable running to our home. So I have been living on what we call, quote, sustainable energy for 30 years. It's a long time to be in, out, quote, out of touch with the electric grid. And, you know, the cost at the time when we moved to this parcel and said, what a beautiful location. The second question is, is there power? Is there water? How will we get power? Where will we get water? And you make those decisions given your circumstances and where you choose to live and how you want to live. And it has to be sustainable. It cannot be a fairy tale. It's got to be economically viable. And once you've done that, you've learned a ton about the electric grid, how it works, how it operates, what wind power can do for us, what water, run of water uh, reservoirs can do for us how solar energy works and how to use it efficiently and what's wasteful and what's not wasteful. And so all of these facets to the concept of renewable energy sustainability and utilizing the land appropriately are right up my alley. I've been in this ranch land environment in agriculture for a number of years, and I used to write a newsletter that was known as the dirt road economists, because everything comes off a dirt road. All of the gear, the laptops, the computers, the cameras, your kitchen table, the counter in your kitchen, whether it's for mica or granite, 
all of these features of our modern lifestyle come from a dirt road somewhere. So the dirt road economy and being good stewards of the land is the most important facet we can have in front of us. Great, thank you very much. Um, Tobias, same question for you. Do you have any priorities for other aspects of the Secretary of State's role? Yeah, I appreciate the way you asked the question because you're right. There are a lot of other aspects. I'd point to two in particular. One uh, is around the corporation division. This is informed by the experience we had in the Treasurer's office uh, rolling out Oregon Saves, the first uh, opt-out retirement plan for uh, for people in the entire country. And the experience of working with corporations and, and learning how important it is to, uh, to, to do the hard, um, disciplined, kind of grinding away work to make sure that, that a program is actually executed well. Um, that those kinds of conversations really inform my thinking and I've had some some interesting conversations about the role that the corporation division might be able to play as more of a single point of contact for state government. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise. It wasn't for me to learn that the businesses and business owners are more interested in running their businesses than in chasing information about new programs or changed reg regulations around state government. And the Secretary of State's Office and the Corporation Division might have a role to play in smoothing that kind of information flow. Um, the second is uh, on, the, on the land board. Um, I've, I've been on the land board uh, since I was elected treasurer, and I think this is a place where our, our differing visions and values and priorities really come clear too. Uh, we've done good work on the land board, uh, modernizing uh, the way we think about uh, public land, um, asking new questions and coming up with creative solutions. The Elliott uh, Research Forest, now the largest research forest in North America. So I want to continue that uh, that work to make sure that that we're prioritizing uh, public land and access and, and thinking about ways to, uh, to protect those resources uh, for, for generations to come. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are just about out of time, but if um, each of you want to just take a, a minute to say why um, you think um, you know, sum up your 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 reasons for for voters. Um, I think, uh, Tobias, how about if you go first on this, and then Dennis, you can have the last word. Okay. Well, again, I, I appreciate you uh, taking time uh, and letting us talk about uh, about this this race. I think you know sometimes uh, as a voter and an observer of other races, uh, I, I've encountered races where where the the choices and the contrasts are not. Uh, entirely clear, but I don't think this is one of those races. I think um, we bring very different uh, values and very different visions for the office uh, in front of voters. Uh, for me, this is about making sure that we are building a, a state where where we are not leaving anyone on the on the sidelines. You know, no matter where a person lives or or who they choose to love or. Uh, what language they speak at home. We are better uh, when more people are choosing to participate in our systems, when they have confidence in the way that we um, that we count votes, the way that we uh, deliver services to people. We have work to do to match our good intentions with good execution. And the Secretary of State's office has an opportunity to do that, both as the chief elections officer and as the auditor for the state. Um, we've not seen the, the stability and professionalism in that office that I think Oregonians need and deserve. I want to bring what I have learned in the state treasurer's office. Um, weaponizing these questions is not what Oregonians want or need professional, um, disciplined vision for the office, I think, is what's called for here. And I'm excited about bringing that approach to the office uh, and in front of voters. Great. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Dennis? Thank you. Um, in closing, uh, Tobias is right. I, I have fought relentlessly to expose the pitfalls of big government. If that's called weaponizing the Secretary of State's office, um, I think that's a mischaracterization. The Secretary of State's office is designed to um, make sure that the legislative mandates are followed effectively and appropriately. So th there is no, quote, weaponization that big government has stepped outside of its boundaries is a perfect place where we should be pushing back on big government. Um, and you'll be aware of this, many listeners will be aware of this in, in terms of the concept of not providing services to those that don't agree with you or disagree with you. In 1835, the Postmaster General in South Carolina refused 
as Postmaster General refused to deliver abolitionist tracts. And this caused, of course, a, a fur within the community. There are those who wanted to maintain slavery and those who were fighting to rid the states. This is 30 years or 25 years in front of the Civil War. And this individual used his public office to avoid disseminating pamphlets that um, were honoring to the uh, Black African Americans who were in the United States and who were arguing they should be treated fair and free. And this is the most fundamental aspect of our American enterprise. And Oregonians have been proud to argue this point over and over again, that we are a free people. We have inalienable rights, that we have equality and justice within our system. And the Secretary of State's office, along with the Attorney General, those are the two perfect offices that can focus in on these issues and hold government itself accountable. Because if we just go on assuming everything government does is correct, then that Postmaster General in South Carolina would have been deemed correct. That's not how history records it. He was wrong. He deserves to be labeled as his actions were wrong. And any government agent who is on that wrong side of history also deserves to get scrutinized and investigated and labeled for their inappropriate actions. So I look forward to um, not having the individuals be trampled underfoot by some bloated bureaucracy, but maintain their freedom and get ahead by voting for Dennis Linthicum for Secretary of State. Thank you. Great. Thank you both again. I really appreciate the conversation and the time that you gave today. Um, I'll be in touch if we have any further questions, but uh, thanks again. Thank, Thank you all. You.